This is a talk about the fundamental evolutionary concepts speciation, domestication, and modernity. It asserts that these concepts, usually thought of as discrete, should be understood as a fixed cluster. A species forms, domesticates itself, and then while straying from its originary Edenic state, and whilst peering back on its lapsed condition, starts to impress itself with its own cobbled together exaptive suite of visual, auditory, olfactory, and tactile strategies. Viz, mimicking, bulking up, getting pretty, generally using art. As it just manages to survive in its new less than perfect, filled with vice and deception, drained out and abstractive world. By way of making our explanation, we will focus on the question of monumentalism, paramorphosis, as a fundamental evolutionary principle, and look at how the concept big, significant, special forms, how it is destroyed or how it keels over and falls away, only to reinsinuate itself epigenetically, so to speak, at a later, more propitious time, rubbing our noses in the fact that it hasn't ever really gone away. Then we will give an outline of how it is that the latter part of this process can end up being identified by humans as the arrival of modernity. This talk was first given on the 24th of September 2015 and is being given today the 5th of February 2019. The tendency towards a clear signaling monumentalism in evolution, the case of epic, or how Darwin can now finally understand the peacock. Preamble. Cells divide owing to some imperative for continued life. And then, after vast stretches of time, this gives rise to a trajectory of onwards and, just for the moment metaphorically, upwards. But just like the dog in the cartoon, this process reaches the rope limit, with the dog who has charged there becoming seriously discomforted choked and incapacitated. And if you don't like the idea of the cartoon dog, you might prefer to consider the situation of those who overdrink, overeat, oversleep, overthink, run too fast, drive too fast, and generally, as we are given to saying, go over the top. Pride, and whatever it is we happen to be overdoing, cometh before a fall. Introduction. This talk is an attempt to clear up a mess that exists in both the sciences and the arts concerning the three concepts, speciation, domestication, modernity. We are going to suggest that the easiest way to do this is to think of all three as a single process seen from slightly different angles. So are we trying to revolutionize the current understanding of biology? No and yes. No, because on the whole, we are happy with the preeminent theories of biology. But yes, one, because we have to rescue Stephen Gould's spandrel acceptation idea, which apparently today would count as a revolutionary move. And yes, two, because we have to completely demolish the idea that only humans, and in only the last 10,000 years, have been the authors of domestication. Our task today will be to give a brief outline of how we think biology actually works. Our particular focus will be why there is a tendency towards gigantism in evolution, and why the species of planet Earth seem to be so devoted to advertising. We are lining up these two topics side by side because it is our view that the advertising art display strategies are a continuation of gigantism by other means. Part one, how biology works, 
theory. Speciation, domestication, and modernity as just one phenomenon. How does complex biology work? It works by speciation. And how does that work? Like this, according to me, a, let's call it proto-species, is wandering around in a landscape. Yes, we are on land just for the moment. The members of the proto-species are merely aimlessly, opportunistically stumbling around. Some of them, however, are lucky enough to be in just the right general area to stumble right into this delimited area which, as chance would have it, has many features conducive to thriving on this planet. Say, heat, good rainfall, fertile soil, horizontality or flatness. I'm going to call this precinct, and not really for poetic reasons, a Garden of Eden. And the conditions found there as Edenic or paradisal. Straight away, the proto-species starts to thrive and starts to, one, move around in this area and to adapt to its particular conditions, just like a Darwinian finch on a Galapagos island. That is, by developing just the right morphology, in the case of the Darwinian finch, beak shape, for the particular conditions of this locale and two, owing to the perfections of its new habitat, and in particular the availability of resources, can't see any reason for moving anywhere else. Can't see any reason for going outside the delimited area. So far, so good for these lucky stumblers with their increasingly perfect morphology for their exploitation of their perfect environment. Things, however, are not so great for those protos still left wandering around and beyond the happy precinct of Eden, who don't know it yet, but as they devote their days to poking around in their less than perfect environments, have effectively fallen behind in the evolutionary struggle being played out on planet Earth, have effectively become disadvantaged second-class citizens in the game of speciation. What I've described so far is what we might call a stage one for terrestrial speciation. And it's all rather easy to understand. In a stage two, things start to get complicated. The source of all the complications is an increase in population. A little diagram is in order here, and let's begin just by explaining this in the briefest outline and simply at the level of what words mean. So here, numbers increase, the source of all developments in stage two. Then size increase, the numbers are increasing because of the good food supply. This gives rise to uninterrupted eating and then size increase. Over here, an association of conspecifics. This is owing to perhaps nothing more than the press of numbers. Down here, the first part of the bifurcation, paramorphosis, are going to an extreme of size, are going to the limit with no brakes on, no constraints operating. This term is from Greek Perao, a verb to go right through. Peras, the noun, an end, an extremity, a termination. And morphere is form. So we're heading towards an extreme form with no breaks on. And just more, one more word on perao, peras. This is a rather unusual twinning of verb and noun. And the verb is to go straight through. The noun is where you end up, a terminal point, having gone through. So the noun is a sort of perfective state of the verb. The oddness of that idea transfers rather well to the oddness of the phenomenon that we are looking at. Over here, domus, the sense of living in a home, Heterochrony, differences in ages, a sort of spread of age difference. Domestication, 
the processes involved with regard to living in a home, and art is a method of signalling. Now let's explain all this in an expanded version. Point one, numbers increase in Eden. Why? Firstly, because animals that are fed properly are generally healthier and live longer. They are also likely to produce more offspring than their competitors. And secondly, because they become occupiers of a space, incumbents, which is generally intimidatory for any casual visitors or passers-by. Point two, paramorphosis. This is a basic principle of physics. Think of chaos theory and the spaces of the possible. You move into spaces of the possible because you can. And you go all the way to the limit because that's where the impossible begins. Point three, our list of four phenomena, domus, how do the group members of Eden have a sense of living in a home? This is an easy one. Their wandering is not really over. And they will keep crossing their Edenic border from time to time. Quite possibly by accident. And over time, build up a mental picture of where Eden is and where it isn't. Heterochrony. Life in Eden will promote, as we've already said, healthy health and longevity. This will give rise to a rather curious nuancing of age and youth. There will not only be the biological distinction between parent and offspring, but an emergent cultural grading of matures and immatures. The older the procreating parents get, the larger their number of offspring and also the larger the number of age-staggered cohorts of offspring. The larger the number of age-staggered offspring, the more the older cohorts of young enter a twilight world of de facto parenthood and a parenthood of the most peculiar kind, quite likely an asexual one and the twilighters become, put simply, middle or later age carers. Domestication. Here we run into an academic roadblock and something of a scandal. And we need to say something about the blockage. It's a near certainty that the general public think that domestication is humans selectively breeding and thereby, quotes, taming wild plants and wild animals. But it's something of a shock to learn that the academy holds exactly the same view. And I can prove it. This book is Documenting Domestication 2006. It's been used as a textbook on this campus and contains these quotes. the top of page two from the introductory essay. Every instance of domestication grows out of a mutualistic relationship between a plant or animal species and a human population that has strong selective advantages for both. Fairly clear. And the bottom of page 15, the next essay, at the front end of this process, domestication is initiated by the creation of a new pattern of behaviour, a new relationship which develops and is sustained between a human society and a target species. So there you have it. This, however, cannot be correct. The domestication being described in this book is an epiphenomenon of something that exists much more widely in nature. And let's see if we can deal with this in very short order. What about the bees? What about those geniuses of domesticity and social organization, the social bees? Did we domesticate them? No, we did not. 
they domesticated themselves, as did other social insects, the ants, the termites, etc. But we can go further than that. What about the animals that live in lairs and nests? Once a species lives in a domus, a fixed home, isn't it already on the path to a substantive domesticity? On the path to social organisation and coding? On the path to the politics of forming groups, forming alliances, and having regulated affiliations. How this happens has already been explained to us by Conrad Lorenz, and quite a long while ago now. Conspecifics congregate, they come into close proximity. Because the aggression of the congregators can't be expressed freely in close confines, it is packaged up into clear ritual displays. In other words, to keep the disruptions of violent behaviour to a minimum, they start to signal efficiently to one another. Very notably, there are clear displays of submission to the higher ranked. And still further, what about animals that live in herds and flocks? They are, to be sure, on the move, but there is a rather formatted geophysics for their moving around. So I'm pretty sure we can speak about them also living in a settled precinct. And when they are on the move in their delimited precinct, they follow a number of simple rules with regard to pack organisation, which seems to me to be an embryonic domestication. Now, art. Art is born of population increase, question mark. It has certainly taken us a long while to realise this, but the game's up now. There have been some stunning recent academic developments on what we'll call human art. We can point to Brian Hayden's summary of the work on Neanderthal social structure, the article of 2012, and Francesco Derrico's talk at this university in May of this year on the symbolic material culture of 35,000 years ago. What we are finding out is that far from the encounter portrayed in even quite recent documentaries of just down from the trees primitive Neanderthal creatures encountering decidedly blonde looking just recently out of Africa technologically and artistically advanced Cro-Magnon men, the meeting of Neando and Cro-Magnon was one of two clades that weren't socially very distant from each other. Shockingly, the Neanderthals seem to have had art before the moderns arrived, but significantly only really in their most populous, well-provisioned centres. So that the much pointed explosion of human creative genius, with especially the cave art of Southern Europe, was really an effluvium of the population increase of that time, with some Neanderthals that are advanced and doing well being joined by an influx of boat people from Africa, probably without the boats, and having to deal with a whole array of status problems, status problems that would have produced a certain amount of clubism. In other words, a sanctifying and codifying of particular identities rituals and secret knowledges. So, I hope that helps to explain this theoretical diagram. But there is one more thing we need to mention in connection with it. A paramorphosis can only ever be a notional paramorphosis. There are, after all, constraints on big plants and animals like the trees and dinosaurs that we are going to be talking about in just a moment. This didn't ever really happen. It was more like this. And this has serious consequences for what is happening between two and three. There is a sort of endless mutually affecting recalibration going on, which we could indicate with a series of arrows like so. 
did it again. I suppose you would say of this, each new gigantism is going to generate a new accommodating domestication, which will eventually generate its own gigantism, which will generate, etc. Now let's leave theory and move to practice. Part two, how biology works. Phase one, gigantism and the rope limit. Let's begin here with some notable cases of natural phenomena getting big at an early point in time. Overcoming all opposition in a Darwinian struggle, if that's what's really happening, and then maintaining their gigantic size when some sort of physical limit has been reached. Trees and dinosaurs, respectively the biggest plants and animals ever to have lived on dry land, are outstanding examples of this. So trees, trees are just big sturdy plants and they had an extraordinary heyday in the Carboniferous period 360 to 300 million years ago when oxygen levels were the highest they have ever been on planet Earth. In a sort of heliotropic arms race, trees outgrew all other competitors to get exposure to the sun's rays on a world landmass that must have been almost entirely rainforest. How did they win the arms race? Answer, their ability to transport moisture from their roots up through column structured trunks hundreds of feet into the air. So it is the design feature of the column trunk that has given trees their 300 million year success. Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs also seem to figure in the oxygen story. During a dip in the oxygen levels in the Permian extinction, a single genus, the dinosaurs, take off in size and dominance over only two real competitors, the reptiles and mammals. Why did this happen? Again, it seems to be a design feature, hollow bones. How the hollow bones work is much controverted. The current view seems to be this, the hollowed bones stored vital minerals required for conditions in the Permian and early Triassic. At this time, the land masses have converged into just one great land mass. This single land mass is so great in size that the whole world climate changes. The center of the single continent becomes dry and world temperatures crash. The hollowed bones in this view allowed for the carrying of minerals in a difficult era of dryness and cold. So there are our two examples of paramorphosis, but let's just state summarily what was advantageous for phenomenon big. If you are big, you have access to a food supply. The trees grab all the sunshine in the canopy to photosynthesize energy. The dinosaurs grow big to eat other animals or if vegetarian to swipe the opposition with a tail while they keep on eating. But let's look at this from the point of view of tree and dinosaur competitors. The ordinary plants and small trees and the mammals and reptiles. What do they do? Something else. Gigantism isn't going to work for them in any brute way. So they resort to some dodging, and I'm going to say creepy techniques. Plants resort to branching, the bending of stalks, and there is the worming around of vines, whilst animals resort to slithering and crawling. Plants, however, and fatefully, do come up with colorful flower display to create a symbiosis with insects and other smaller creatures. What happens next? 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs depart the scene, and this has interesting consequences for all the previously cowed and stunted species. You'd think the race for big might start up all over again. 
and perhaps that happens. Mammals do, for instance, start to increase in size. But on the whole, owing to the constraints of existing biological formats, animals now freed from the tyrannies of their dinosaur tormentors embark on a period of much greater concern for signaling their interests and displeasures to their competitors and conspecifics. And this brings us to a new orientation for complex biology, signals, rituals, and aesthetics. Phase two, how an animal ritualizes or aestheticizes. How do our smaller league players, our non-paramorphs, go about ritualizing or aestheticizing? Let's take as a case one, the long story of how we ended up with social kissing. Back at the dawn of complex biology on land, animals started to take care of their own offspring. This couldn't have happened earlier in the sea because of the difficulties of keeping up any close association with your offspring in water. So it's mammals and even reptiles that become the first carers. And here we can see not only the first domesticity, but also the split in ranking that we expect will go along with it. The differential ranking of parents and offspring. One of the first things that happens in this two-part ranking is that the offspring beg the parents for food. This not only involves the aesthetics of showing your parents the lovely insides of your mouth and the aesthetics of calling and screeching at them, but also the interesting behavior of placing your mouth or beak close to theirs to see if they have food. In the case of some mammals, to check with the tongue whether the parent has eaten recently and what it was they ate. The poking, prodding and approaching the parent with an open probing muzzle has the desirable effect of getting parents to regurgitate food. This is notably the behavior of wolves and the members of dog packs and has been retained as a nearly ritualized behavior in the modern domesticated dog. Interestingly, we humans also have retained our own ritualized version of this behavior. It is a social pressing of the lips against someone else's face. In English, we have the word kiss, in German, kusen, and in ancient Greek, the cognate kuneo, meaning to kiss or to entreat beseech. It has a poetic form of kuso and a past tense of ekusa. This word means etymologically to do the dog. The word for dog in Greek is kuon, plural kunes. We also know that social, effectively political, kissing is well in evidence in the ancient world. At the salutatio, the Roman breakfast put on by patrons for their clients, the clients are kissing the patron to signal fidelity and we might say to signal their status as subordinates. All this becomes crushingly ironic in the Christian story when Judas kisses Jesus at what the Mediterranean audience would understand to have been the early morning salutatio, where Jesus is the master and the disciples the clients. Nowadays, I hardly have to tell you, kissing is widely practiced among relatives and close friends. And all this speaks rather loudly about the way in which the whole contemporary world wishes to position itself as politically humble and more generally wants to lay claim to being devoted to the support and care of others. Our second case of the path to aesthetics is the feather. Back in the time of the Triassic, dinosaurs, as we have said, come to prominence over mammals and their own relatives, the reptiles. But not all dinosaurs grow large. Despite not being particularly well represented in our fossil record, small bones don't survive millions of years as well as big ones, there were small dinosaurs. The situation of these smaller dinosaurs must have been precarious. They were in danger of being eaten by, trodden on, or tail swatted by 
the bigger dinosaurs. But they also seem to have had another problem. In the Permian and early Triassic periods, the world's temperature has plummeted. As a consequence, small animals can have a thermoregulation problem. Here's the plummet here. Biophysics comes to the rescue in the case of the small dinosaurs with that famous dermal growth, the feather, along with the peculiar design modification, the wing. Wings weren't new on planet Earth, many insects already had them, but feathers were. Once warm enough to survive, however, the smaller feathered dinosaurs found that their feathers had other uses. Netting passing airborne insects was one of them. Clambering into bushes and small trees to escape their own predators was another. The second of these acceptations was fateful. Once in bushes and trees, they learnt that when the threat of predator danger had passed, they could glide the short distance to the ground without injuring themselves. And so it was that a certain number of small dinosaurs learnt to fly and found many niche paradisal locations in which to thrive as the new class birds, aves. The various species of birds have had a long lasting place in the psyche of humans. And I'd like to say a bit about this by way of dealing with the topic of a trajectory towards aesthetic uses. Humans, especially ones who have inherited a theology that the gods or the single god were to be located in the sky or generally up high on mountaintops, for instance, have long held the view that birds were connected to divinity. The eagle has been a symbol of divine power. The dove, a symbol of a god's peaceful intentions. But brightly coloured birds from the tropics have had a special place in the European understanding of a bird's divinity. Although the first pheasants probably came into Europe from Africa, Europeans following the views of the Greeks thought of pheasants and peacocks as coming from the exotic east. The technical term Fasianidae which gives us the everyday designation pheasant, originally denoted that these birds came from the river Pharsus on the east coast of the Black Sea. The Greeks thought of this area as epicentral for the exotic, magical, and weird. It's where gold and golden fleeces come from. It's where violent and out of control women a particular phobia for the Greeks come from, such entities as Amazons and Medea. In reality, these birds were probably coming from India or Southeast Asia, but reality with regard to these birds isn't much of a consideration, and the idea that they have some special connection to heaven or paradise or royalty persists in, for instance, the early Christian writers. They have plenty to say about, in particular, peacocks and divinity. One recurrent view is that the eyes of the peacock's tail are as the eyes of God, which are legion and which see all. Another topic is the problem of why peacocks, which are named for the noise they make, in medieval times, peacock, have anything to screech about. The answer, they have a supernal upper half body and tail display and disgustingly ordinary thin and unimpressive legs and feet. So the peacock lets out its significant, its, its signature screech every time it looks down and learns the shocking truth of its sublunar lower parts. Always trust churchmen to come up with a fantastical moral explanation for a biological phenomenon. It seems, however, to be well into the medieval period before peacock becomes a term of abuse for a vain person. 
But now scroll down to the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries and first a ship of Magellan's and then the British and Dutch East India companies are bringing to Europe the corpses of the New Guinean birds of paradise. From this time, European books on ornithology start to depict the birds of paradise as just strangely colored peacocks. The full shock of their astounding displays has only become clear in recent times with the advent of TV documentaries. And it is just as well for Darwin that he didn't ever see these birds of paradise in action or he would have had a heart attack. These birds are much bigger show-offs than any peacock. The peacock has its shrill cry and magnificent tail, but these birds have color displays that while stunning in themselves can involve a flashing color switching effect that is achieved when a sort of hatched grading of feathers catches the light as the bird sways and leaps in a rhythmic dance. A further embellishment is that the dance is conducted accompanied by calls and clicks that mimic other birds. In the most extreme cases of bird of paradise display, the black sickle bill, the superb and the various parotias, especially the laws and wands parotias, have just about solved the early Christian writer's problem of the worldly legs and feet, and even that of the head and eyes, frequently managing to transform into just one shape with flashing color switches, colored spots for stylized eyes, colored beards, and all this is taken, all this is with dance movements that can include spectacular dramatic freezing and whipping and hooting sounds. In other words, many of these birds are close to aestheticizing themselves clean out of existence. Here's our bird of paradise. Here are the so-called eyes. Here, the beard, all artificial. And just before we sum up here, how have the male birds of paradise managed to devote their whole lives to this carry-on? It is all because of paradisal conditions. They are for the most part high up in the New Guinean or Northern Australian forest canopy where they have almost no predators. Also the extreme abundance of fruit and material for nests means that the female can raise the offspring all by herself. Consequence, the artist male is left to refine and perfect his show. So in short, feathers started as an adaptation for thermoregulation, then accepted to insect trapping, then to being an aid to gain purchase clambering into trees, then became used in gliding, later flying, and finally finished up as art. Part three, how biology works, a modern example, civilization. When high civilization takes off, it follows the pattern we've outlined. Soon after its inception, it goes in unashamedly for gigantism. Better called in view of so many petrifacts, monumentalism. Egypt is a well-known example. The Egyptian pyramid started off as a fairly simple platform that contained a depressed area at its centre where the dead king was buried. Priests have access to this tomb by simply walking down into it. A succeeding king builds a platform above the previous one, and so it is that a step pyramid comes into existence. By this rather simple arrangement, Priests participate in a royal death cult by ministering to and communicating with a line of dead kings. And in the physical step pyramid, the general public are given a visual proof of a power political fact. Dynasty. 
Later, the step pyramids are streamlined into the more familiar triangular sided shape. Then there is a paramorphic acceleration and we reach a new stage in royal megalomania. One pyramid to a king. And probably motivated by not wanting to be shackled by the political realities and limitations of earlier regnal eras, each pyramid gets bigger. Finally, the pyramids of Gizeh are built and the age of these monuments reaches the rope limit and comes to a sudden and really very early end, around 2550. Later on, Egypt will try two other monumentalisms. First, Amenophis III and notoriously his son Akhenaten in the New Kingdom try to introduce monotheism. A very sudden throttling of this occurs with the fall of Akhenaten and the destruction of his new religion. Second, Ramesses II introduces a monumentalism of petrifacts of royal ideology, which concludes towards the end of his long reign, 67 years, and very much as a result of his encounters with and his having to accommodate the Hittite Empire. Other civilizations begin with a period of monumentalism. Let's quickly trawl through this rather controversial terrain. China. The recently discovered terracotta army and the as yet only partially uncovered super palace is the first indication that China did in fact have an early monumental period. The mysterious and still poorly understood civilization of Jeroft, perhaps the Arata of Sumerian myth, in today's southern Iran, possibly a civilization that predates Sumer, had an edifice that is described on the relevant Wikipedia page as a two-story windowed citadel with a base of close to 13.5 hectares. For the fourth millennium BC, astounding. Central America. The Olmecs, which were up until the 21st century considered the first civilization for Meso Mesoamerica, have the colossal stone heads, which weigh between 6 and 40 tons, and are dated mostly to the early pre-classical period, 1500 to 1000 BC. Much later, the sprawling Machu Picchu was built by Pachacuti, or is dedicated to him, the first expansionist Inca king. And in Britain, at the stunning Brolgar, Brodgar site in the Orkney Islands, you have a ranging, sprawling ritual complex which eventually becomes centred on just one big edifice. Its dates are probably 3000 to 2500 BC. 500 years before Avebury and Stonehenge. So in summary, very many documented civilizations begin with a paramorphic monumental period. Later on, other monumentalisms are introduced, but only usually much reduced in size and only in a more specialized context. An Athenian Acropolis, a Lincoln Cathedral in 14th century England, and a Sydney Opera House. Now, what is probably much less obvious than the screaming long-lasting fact of stone architecture is that some of the early civilizations start to have a sense that their own monumentalisms pose a problem. The ancient Egyptians show a great keenness for defacing their own monuments, and the people of Orkney in 2500 BC seem to have very calmly dismantled their own central edifice. But beyond that, there is the matter of oral and written culture. And we know about the problem in a general way with the widespread phenomenon of an early mythological strife between the gods, who are the mythic equivalent of monumental architecture. But we also know about this in a much more specific way from the epics that have survived from early civilizations. Three obvious cases are Gilgamesh, the Iliad Odyssey, and the Bible.
What has to be said about the epics at the outset is that they are fundamentally ironical structures. After all, if you have the leisure to sit back and listen to a well-paid and accomplished bard, to hear your monumental national story, you're already at quite a distance from the suffering that went into creating the original monumental structure. And from the suffering of the genius hero who has to endure the difficult situation that emerges after its destruction, you're at a remove from all those things. But just leaving that matter aside for the moment, let's quickly look at the content of the three epic traditions. In summary, they meditate on original monumentalisms, then on their fateful fall, and then on the disturbing or amusing ironies of the aftermath. In Gilgamesh, the eponymous hero who has been, despite some bad behavior, the creator of civilization, and sees only a glorious immortal career for himself, has, halfway through the epic, the ironic realization after the death of his companion Enkidu that he too, despite his divine connections and his being in receipt of divine favor, is going to die. This launches the second half of the epic and his follow-up ironic realization that he is going to have to go as a sort of supplicant to the ends of the earth to learn about what shifts can be resorted to in order to dodge death. The Iliad Odyssey is really the classic in the genre. Here the monumentalism is Troy, with all its paradisal perfections and especially its intimidatory monumental walls, which are annoying the Greeks into spending 10 years there trying to defeat it. And when they finally succeed, the aftermath raises the ironic possibility that rather than occupying themselves with fulfilling their national destiny, they might have been better off staying at home. This becomes literally the problem for Agamemnon and Odysseus, who find that the world has moved on disastrously in their time at Troy. Agamemnon doesn't notice and pays a heavy price. Odysseus, far better at moving with the times, shows that the new world circumstances are better treated with an ironic orientation. But at the end of the Odyssey, it is shown in the poem's grimmest irony that even that might not be enough. In the Bible, the monumentalism of Egypt is escaped and the paradise of Canaan is attained by knocking over its cities only to find that the promised people, now successfully installed in their own promised land, are their own worst enemy. Sliding into the irony of being ordinary sinners, lawbreakers, idolaters, ignorers, or worse still, chastisers of God's special messengers, the prophets. Along with the superiority of some of those prophets being themselves weak. Ah along with the super irony of some of those prophets being themselves weak, so weak as to seriously ponder avoiding their vocation, as, for instance, happens with Jonah, who suspects that being a fire-breathing, castigating Israelite prophet at the Assyrian capital will probably not go well for him. Perhaps I can sum up on this fixed structure for the epics in a little cartoon. Imagine you are inside a 7th century BC Greek mainland household. The son bounds in and says to the father, Dad, there is this great new poem. It's called The Odyssey. It's about a hero that lies, deceives, and pretends to be other people. And the father says, Listen to me, you little twerp. No son of mine is going to lie, deceive, or dissemble. Decent people don't do that. And just by the way, there is no better poem than the Iliad. It's the acknowledged classic. It's of course about knocking over those wife-stealing, ridiculously wealthy and disgustingly self-important Trojans, people who are infuriatingly better set up and more successful at doing what our own genius ancestors have done from time immemorial, viz. steal women, appropriate other people's wealth 
and then quietly lord it over everyone because they know themselves to be so superior, despite their own challenging originary circumstances. Son, yeah, Dad, that really makes sense. Father, blood pressure rising. Are you, are you getting ironic with me? Speedy exit of son. Part four, some really, really, really modern examples. The really modern examples here are from the end of the 19th century on. The first thing that needs to be said about Joyce, Kafka and Beckett, and perhaps even, heaven help us, Alfred Jarry, is that they are modern classics. What, however, people need to bear clearly in mind is that when all these literateurs started out, they were all considered not just the avant-garde, but the very edgiest edge of the avant-garde. So that we are living in a very unusual era where you can go from sheer cultural experimentalism to rock hard classic in a few decades or even less. A truly remarkable era where yesterday's transgressive art phenomenon is absorbed and digested by a cultural establishment. Yes, turned into a cultural monumentalism. In other words, the speciation pattern I'm arguing for, the movement between points two and three is starting to speed up exponentially. Within the texts of Jarry, Joyce, Kafka and Beckett, what is the great monumentalism? It's modern society itself. The modern person has become, to follow Kafka's idea, an insect man. The individual has become a sort of shocking oddity in a streamlined world of modern machines and social conformities. In the design to shock literary imaginings of Enfant Terrible, Alfred Jarry, the world has fallen prey to the monstrous Macbeth sender, bourgeois, Père Ubu. In this view, all the crimes of modern man are apparently to be traced to suburban dads. Although there is also Mère Ubu. Joyce at least sees a sort of odyssey heroism in the life of an ordinary man as he makes his way around an ordinary modern city. But in Beckett, the contemporary world becomes a venue for a desperate, albeit entertaining and defiant, struggle as absurd person singular, thinking entity, holds on grimly to sanity through an accurately expressed ironic vision of the tenuity and helplessness of his situation. A related, but one would have to say more upbeat set of artists tackle the modernity problem in quite a different way. This is Warhol, Bowie and Humphreys. Here the modern art phenomenon is sharply focused on fun or pleasurability, even when it's grim. There's no deep philosophy and there's no real understanding of historical or evolutionary or existential peril. The individual, far from dying the terrible death of modern insect insignificance, is getting out there and creating his own monumentalism. Warhol is a good place to start for this. When Warhol was asked why he had made an eight hour movie of the Empire State Building, he replied that he wanted to create something that was big in form and content. And with a sort of indefatigable mechanicality possessed only by the autistic child, which is what he effectively was, he churned out differently colored lithographs of Chairman Mao, Elvis Presley and Marilyn Monroe, simply because they were interesting, larger than life celebrity commodities that made nice images. And he could sell them. The career of David Bowie is pretty well known. In a long high profile time in pop music, he put out a series of albums where he managed to change his identity for just about each one of them. 
starting as a non-commercial avant-gardist, he decided money could be made by simply doing something quintessentially modern and just changing your persona and the preoccupations that go along with it, and doing it on a regular basis. So it was that, the cre that he created the series of monumentalisms, Ziggy Stardust, The Diamond Dog, The Scary Piero Monster of Fashion, Major Tom the Astronaut, and above all, the very inclusive we who could be heroes, but only for one day. Now, Barry Humphreys. Dame Edna is an intriguing and very local take on putting a bright gloss on a troubling landscape. Humphrey's best-known satirical persona, Dame Edna Everidge, started life as Mrs. Norm Everidge. You have to be at least as old as me to remember this, but married women used to be styled Mrs. and then their husband's full name. Mrs. Norm Everidge was definitely not a dame of the British Empire, and in fact was, as her name suggested, an ordinary suburban housewife. To characterise this ordinariness, Edna wore the most drab 1950s clothes and offered her opinion on nothing more interesting than houses, household furniture, household appliances and decorations, and various food items. So, for instance, she would comment on whether a cake had been homemade or, expression of disgust, bought. In the early 1970s, Edna left her drab suburban self behind and became a self-described mega, later giga, star. And again, her own description, a glittering sophisticate. In her own mind, she was more of a celebrity than any American, as cultured as any European, as wise as any philosopher or professional social commentator. By fiat, Edna Everidge just turned into a monumental star. Dame Edna, along with Warhol and Bowie, make up for me a nice little popular gallery of what speciation and modernity are. Shocking your conspecifics with celebrity amazingness and then outdoing that in a series of paramorphic extremes of art with mimicry, metamorphosis, and metaphor. So those seven figures are our representative moderns. But the presentation so far of how evolution works, whilst it's all reasonably easy to grasp, first you have the paramorphosis, then the domestications and the clear signaling that goes along with it. Then come the ironies and monstrously wrong signaling as a new paramorphosis. But what we still need is one single operative mechanism which will sew all the ideas presented so far together. And I would recommend for this passive aggressivity. The wiki internet site on this topic offers that the originator of the concept was an American World War II colonel who noted that soldiers under his command, when not particularly wanting to do something, lapsed into a sort of sullen conformity and adopted a work to the barest minimum of requirements, work to regulations only attitude. And that seems to have a ring of psychological truth to it. Everyone is familiar with, for instance, industrial working to regulations and go slows and general snarkiness. But I'm not really buying the idea that this concept begins with World War II or colonels. I think we need to go back a little earlier to 1904 and the publication of Freud's Psychopathology of Everyday Life. Freud didn't have any particular opinion about this small book and seems to have thought of it as the merest side project. On some people, however, it had a profound effect. And one of those was Wilhelm Reich, a student of Freud's. Even though in the late 1920s, Freud and Reich had an acrimonious falling out over both contemporary politics and theoretical issues, Reich was completely an adherent to the thesis of the Freud book. In 1933, he published his own book, Character Analysis, 
where, taking Freud's ideas to an extreme, he argued that all personality was a type of mental illness. All personality was a defense mechanism. In a large study of admittedly very far from everyday people, Reich went through a range of case studies on personality types and overly, the overly reserved person, the overly jolly person, etc. And he cogently argued that their neurotic problems, far from being deep and inscrutable, were to be read right on the everyday surface. The theoretics of Reich, when connected to those of Conrad Lorenz about aggression management within conspecific groups, is really the way to understand how the mechanism of domestication actually produced our modern world. The entire collaborative project of modernity is based on the idea that people will be passive, i.e. forfeit all their political freedom, in order to pursue aggressively a specialist agenda. It's the idea that anyone in society can get the feeling of being a sovereign entity so long as they limit it to a sharply circumscribed area of work activity or personal presentation. A proof that even the general public understand these ideas is the in actual fact epiphenomenal cocktail party concept of passive aggressivity. The concept of the American colonel with regard to his sullen underlings. But we need to generalize from this to give our final portrait of the modern person. A captious, snarling skeptic, a person who does nothing beyond job description, who works to regulations only, and who is a revolutionary in their own mind. Part five, a postscript. Gillian Flynn's Gone Girl, 2012. It occurs to me that the examples I've given of modernity in action present some difficulties. First, the ancient epics are remote in time and remote in culture. Second, the texts of Jarry, Joyce, Kafka and Beckett are well beyond the intellectual tastes of the sapiens in the street. And third, Warhol, Bowie and Dame Edna are generally too exotic for the average person to identify with. So I've decided to finish up my examples of modernity in action with something the wider world can relate to. Gillian Flynn's novel, Gone Girl. This book is a recent bestseller and somewhat extraordinarily has been discussed on late night TV shows. It tackles in a memorable way the two issues, invention of identity and making it big in the modern world. A recently married New York couple, both writers, lose their jobs in the 2008 financial crisis and decide to go and live in the comparative quiet and squalor of Missouri. Since the Mississippi River has a certain profile in the story and Twain is at one point alluded to, the idea of lighting out for the territory, i.e. going for an adventure in country back blocks, will come to mind for most readers. How will the New Yorkers do in the straightened circumstances of regional USA? Seems to be the question posed by the novel. And the answer seems to be, not well. When the wife, the styled from childhood Amazing Amy, mysteriously disappears from the couple's house and suspicion falls directly on the husband. This novel might not have made much of an impression on me had I not read in an interview that Flynn's favorite author was Thackeray and that her favourite character was the well-named Becky Sharp in Vanity Fair. Intriguing details. The writer of a book that is pointedly concerned with the idea of what is a modern person is happy to have as a central figure for all literature an upstart. A parvenu, and here's an interesting word, arriviste, someone who is arriving. In other words, from this point of view, modernity is all about arriving and, if the fate of Amazing Amy is anything to go by, involves away from the civilized center and out in the wilds of reality, a large amount of carefully calculated imposture. Conclusion. In this talk, we've argued that speciation, domestication and modernity are best understood as just one thing. The driving mechanism for biology is increase, followed by size, 
followed by the inability to compete with size, which results in a domesticating nicheism and the recourse to compensating artistic monumentalisms, which can end up in some theoretical last point as a myriad of specialist orientations. The whole process can, on the one hand, result in a certain amount of dyspepsia, as individuals are forced to participate in a competitive game of appearances. But, on the other hand, the accurate signalling in the prosperous centres of speciation and the cunning imitation of it carried out by the hard-pressed periphery suggests that there is a certain amount of productive fun being had and still to be had. Thanks.